Hello, everybody. I'm David Berlin. I'm the editor in chief of Blockchain Journal, and I'm here to host another webinar at the request of Hedera. We are here to talk about one of the most important aspects of what blockchain can do for a lot of applications, and this has to do with verifying the veracity and the trust that is in the data that you uh, put up to a blockchain. And it's not just about transactional data that has to do with cryptocurrency payments. You can use blockchain to verify and, and, and put trust in other forms of data as well. Now, here to talk to me about this idea and this use case is Guy Harrison, who is the uh, he is the founder and he's also the CTO of Proven DB, which was acquired by OneSpan, where he's now the innovation architect. And then also we have Adam Rose on the line, who is the COO of Starling Lab. And so the first thing I'm going to do first is welcome both of you to this webinar. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, David. Hello, everyone. Good day, Adam. Hey, hey, thanks for having us on today. Excited to talk about uh, these potential applications and real world applications of blockchain today. Yeah, it, well, you guys are working on something that's incredibly cool, and we'll get to it in a minute. And it just has to do with that idea of veracity and trust, but also in this multi-party uh, context, which is one of those things that blockchain is really well suited to when you have data that has to be looked at by a lot of different organizations and they all need to trust it. But first, I want to find out a little bit, little bit about each of your organizations. So we'll start with you, Guy. What is it that OneSpan does, particularly in the context of the fact that it was acquired Proven DB, where you were the CTO and founder? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, OneSpan's a security and digital agreements company. Uh, so when you think about digital agreements, simplistically, we're talking about e-signatures. Um, OneSpan um, differentiates from other e-signature vendors, such as um, DocuSign and Adobe by having a broader security context in around authentication, um, veracity and so forth. And we do a lot of digital authentication at large banks. Um, so um, at large banks that don't use things like Google Authenticator, they usually have a dedicated device. Those dedicated devices are often one span devices. So, but where one span's moving increasingly in the future is towards digital agreements with security as a sort of a foundation layer that. And so when we're looking at digital agreements and the threats against them, um, they thought that Proving DB technology, which allows um, them to take digital agreements and sort of like anchor them to the blockchain, was a good fit, a way to sort of like add increased veracity and survivability for agreements. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in detail a bit later on. But yes. the short story is um, signing documents um, how do you know in 10 years that that document is still valid? Well, the answer is we use um, distributed ledger technology to ensure it's sort of long-term survivability. That'll be an interesting conversation because one of the things I'm thinking about right off the bat is there's a bunch of e-signature solutions that are out there that don't use blockchain. So I'm, I'm definitely curious to find out what it is about blockchain that makes an e-signature even better than it is today. Okay, let's move over to Adam. Tell me a little bit about what Starling Lab does. Sure. So Sterling Lab was co-founded by the Stanford University Department of Electrical Engineering and USC Shoah Foundation. And our work is really applied research. What we do is try and address questions about provenance and preservation of important digital records. That could be anything from a photograph to a video to databases. Uh, it might be a web recording, anything that is subject uh, to what we increasingly hear about in the worlds of misinformation and disinformation. We're trying to figure out how how do we address uh, in real world solutions, real world proofs of concept, um, ways to help people understand what uh, sorts of data and records they can or cannot trust? Okay, the fact that I have both of you here, and I know that both of you are working together, I can almost envision where this is going, which is that you're talking about misinformation, disinformation, and battling it, creating photographic or documented records of, of the actual facts. I can imagine that that information needs to be signed in some way to uh, verify its uh, authenticity, its veracity, and its trustworthiness over a very long period of time, perhaps 10 years forward. Let's talk a little bit about what it is exactly that the two of you are working on. I'll throw it out to either one of you. What's the project at hand here? Um, Adam, why don't you take that one to sort of like give the overview of uh, all of Starling's technology? 
Sure. Well, so Starling in our research works across uh, three different practice areas, journalism, law, and history. So uh, we teamed up with Guy on a project related to journalism and specifically with Reuters, who we had partnered with uh, before. And we wanted to try and figure out ways that authenticity data could travel along with photographs that they produced through a professional newsroom workflow. Now, you know, it's one thing to actually do things conceptually and to try and figure out how do we sign things, uh, you know, in a more academic sense. But how does that actually work in the day to day operations of a very busy, very robust uh, newsroom where they've got a lot to do in terms of not just taking a photo, but you think about the whole life cycle of that from the moment of capture on a camera when the light hits the sensor all the way through different steps of normal photo editing. You know, you think about permissible edits like color corrections and crops and then uh, ultimately to distribution. And then how do audiences find that information and then find ways to verify that it is the original photo as it purports to be. So uh, we teamed up on a proof of concept uh, that was published by Reuters involving a uh, Canon camera uh, that was signing on device and allowing us to follow that uh, piece of information or several uh, photos, I should say, uh, across their life cycle until they were actually published online and made available for people to inspect uh, with the provenance data fully embedded and also registered uh, through uh, distributed ledgers. I'm going to go back to what you talked about because you mentioned misinformation and disinformation earlier. I am not a photography expert. I'm not an image expert, but I do know about this idea of deep fakes. And I do know how people can manipulate existing photographs or invent completely new ones out of mid -air, uh, thin air using something like Mid Journey. And, uh, and that has resulted in the spread of very, very, you know, damaging misinformation and disinformation. Is that the type of problem that you're looking to address? You're exactly right. That is the larger problem. But what's unique about this is in the way of addressing it. Uh, there's this really incredible world of fact checkers out there who might take a photo and try and inspect it and do forensic analysis later on. What they're doing is they're taking a photo or other piece of information once it's traveled downstream. So we look at this situation and say, how can we get upstream? How do we get to the point of capture of an image and start to imbue that image, the file, with authenticity data? And that way people can and later inspect it and see whether or not this was a, whether it's a deep fake video or whether it's an altered photo, that they're able to evaluate that for themselves. So rather than um, you know, jumping in and saying we're solving everything about this space, which is a very large and, and complicated space right now, we want to ensure that at least some records, and really the most important records that may be out there, often being produced by professional newsrooms like Reuters, that those are protected in terms of their veracity and allow people to inspect the authenticity records, which can either travel with that photo or be registered across any number of blockchains. And is this hmm. something that both Reuters and the consumers of the information that Reuters puts out, and I realize they have a special set of customers, which are other media organizations, but they also have, they go direct to the consumer. Is there a demand for this? In other words, like, are, are, are people saying, hey, look, I want to double click into that image and learn more about uh, its life cycle and whether or not um, it's questionable in terms of the, its authenticity? Well, I wouldn't want to speak for Reuters or their customers, but I think I can speak for the industry. And just as an average person who is online reading articles from major newsrooms, but also consuming social media, right now there is a lot of confusion, a lot of concern, um, and on some levels, a certain amount of fear around the way that information is spreading uh, that may or may not be accurate, that may or may not be faked uh, information. And so it is certainly something that people are trying to address, everyone from the federal mm -hmm. government to you know small startups to major media corporations. And there are these really wonderful alliances that are starting uh, in collaborations between uh, a lot of uh, media organizations, hardware manufacturers, and software developers to try and address the problem. So I think in a way, there may be problems that people don't quite know how to articulate. Really, really strong parallel to me is HTTPS. 
you know, the idea that we need secure ways to connect to the internet, people weren't out there demanding HTTPS as a solution. And if you go to the average person today and they click, uh, you know, onto a website, they're not necessarily going to that lock icon and opening up everything and seeing that, you know, SHA-256 was used, right? But if they see a lock icon, they tend to feel better and they know that they can inspect it. And in fact, now browsers will warn you and say, hey, you know, this, this site you're going to is not secure. So in a similar way, I think what we're doing is getting ahead of this issue right now and saying that in the very near future, we are coming to a point in time where it's so easy to fake information, it already is, and what we need to do is provide ways that it can be authenticated. So groups like the uh, coalition, uh, uh, the CAI, um, uh, coalition, uh, for, um, uh, sorry, I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm stumb stumbling over my words there. Um, content authenticity initiative um, is uh, one of the the great uh, industry groups that's leading the way here, um, and they have put out a standard C2PA, which was used in our project with Reuters. Um, and you know there are people coming together to try and address these things because we know it is a very real problem in the information ecosystem. You mentioned the C2PA. Yeah. What is that? Do you know what that is? Uh, <laughs> There's so many acronyms, yeah, so, so no, sometimes we get so comfortable using them that we don't even remember what they stand for. Do you, do you know what that stands for? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the uh, Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. And sorry, I was stumbling over my words earlier because yeah. of that exact reason. <laughs> it can be an alphabet <laughs> soup uh, with so many different acronyms. Of course. And so I, you know, in, in that same way, uh, like I mentioned in that that example, right, people, you know, don't know what HTTPS always stands for. They don't know what, what a SHA-256, what the SHA stands for. Mm -hmm. But those things exist and they need to exist. So in that same way, we're applying these uh, approaches. So C2PA is the, is, it's the standard, it's the spec. And then CAI uh, is the actual, one of the overseeing organizations that's helping to develop a lot of open source uh, projects around that. Um, C2PA itself is, is controlled uh, and, and uh, owned by the Linux Foundation. I see, okay, thank you. Let's uh, switch over to Guy. Guy, uh, I can totally understand the, the uh, reasons for being for something like what Starling Lab is doing, being an editor myself, having worked with content, having, uh, you know, a, a long time ago, I actually tried my, my own hand at developing a system that we called the uh, Media Transparency Project, where you could at least verify the origins of certain information, like other people could go in and say, where, where was... Where was this information sourced from? Not necessarily whether or not that information had been tampered with uh, in its journey, but I can imagine that an e-signature technology would come in really handy for making some of this information, once its authenticity has been determined, tamper-proof, but I just don't know. So why don't you take the take the ball here oh. and let us know, and fill in the blanks for us. What, what is Proven DB's mm -hmm. technology doing here? Yep, no problem. Um, so, firstly, I, I think, you know, I'd like to just emphasize again how significant this is, not just to one industry, but to civilization as a whole. If we end up in a situation where we have no shared facts whatsoever, it's hard to see how we can progress forward, right? We've always had disputes about facts, but there's always been sort of some process for reconciling, you know, what is true and what is not. And it used to be, you know, you can believe your own eyes. Um, and photographic evidence and other sorts of, you know, forensic evidence were sufficient to um, prove, you know, what's what. And now, for a variety of reasons, all got to do with technology, we're losing that ability. Uh, so, you know, this is incredibly, what, what Adam's team is doing, I think, is just so incredibly important. Um, so, in general, I'll, I'll get to e-signatures in a bit, but let me just step back a bit to ProvenDB itself, because ProvenDB is a more general purpose um, data storage solution in which everything that's stored is versioned and everything that's stored can be anchored to a distributed ledger. So by versioned, I mean, we've all used databases probably, and we all know that, you know, you insert something, you update it, you delete it. And when you delete it, it's gone. And when you update it, the old version's gone and replaced by the new version. In Proven DB, that's not what happens. Everything is kept. You've got a complete record of all of the changes and those changes um, have digital signatures, hashes, as Adam was talking about, that are um, included in a sort of an aggregate hash that's written to a distributed ledger. So you know for certain that this data existed in the database at this point in time. And should anyone try and tamper with it, um, then 
um, those signatures will be broken and you can think of it as a tamper resistant seal on a bottle of Tylenol or something. Yes, you can break the seal, but you can't break the seal and get away with it, right? You, people will know you've broken the seal. So this gives you a, a data storage solution in which you can trust what you're looking at. No one really knows what's true and what's not, right? You know, computer, computer technology can't prove that something, some piece of information is accurate. Not really. But we can prove that it hasn't been changed and we can prove when it was created. And that's what we did in a general case with Proven DB. So at Starling, um, they, they needed a sort of a database to, to store the changes that Adam was talking about when you take an initial image that's signed by the camera itself and then you want to crop it or, or you know, change its hue or do whatever, tons and tons of photographic manipulations go on all the time in these things. And you've got this sort of chain of evidence stored in the proven DB database that is therefore, you know, validated by the blockchain. Now, yeah. e-signatures, um, uh, well, maybe I'll pause there for a minute and let you respond and yeah, then well, move no, on I, to e-signs. I can certainly envision the use the use cases for this, uh, especially here in the U.S., where uh, there are a number of active court cases going on where imagery is being used, not, or maybe not court cases, but also just hearings, government level hearings, where they're saying, "Oh, this is what that person was holding in their picture. It was a weapon. It was a badge. It was something." When in, fact we take a closer look and it was something like a vape or, or some other thing but mm -hmm. somebody has an agenda there to say that that thing that was a vape was actually something else that it wasn't and then uh, suddenly there's a bunch of disinformation or misinformation out there and uh, it causes all sorts of chaos so I, I, I can imagine the, the the need for what you're describing because then what happens with that image is it starts off as, you know, uh, an image of somebody walking down the hall of a capital or something like that. And then the next thing you know, you're looking at a close up, a close up. So it's been cropped, but you don't know if that close up has been manipulated in any other way. It's been cropped already. So that by itself is a manipulation. So uh, I, I can just see <laughs> the the applications of a technology like this. What I don't understand, though, is. Uh, for a very long time, we've had versioning technologies around. I mean, if we take something as simple as the Wikipedia, you can take any document that's on the Wikipedia and dig back in time. And, and I would imagine that the Wikipedia itself, uh, even though the information that people are putting in there might be questionable, but the versions themselves, I'm, I, I'm guessing, I don't mm -hmm. know, uh, I'm guessing that the Wikipedia organization is in some way uh, making the versions themselves tamper-proof so that you can't go back and sort of tamper with the entire mm. trail, you know, journey of that information to the point that people think, okay, what I'm looking at is in fact the truth when there was a different Zip. version of that truth earlier. Is it, it so is, right. what, what's- Well, I can what, answer that. So, so, yeah. so Wikipedia's data, as uh, uh, least, you know, the last time I looked is all stored in MySQL databases. Mm -hmm. um, and so those MySQL databases can have an update statement applied to them that changes anything in the past. They're not tamper-proof at all. I mean, they'll, I'm sure Wikipedia have good, solid procedures saying don't, you know, update old data. But it's not the same as a blockchain and mutable record on a blockchain. But, but if you have, facing... let, me, let me just let me just pause you there. If you hash the versions, there's a way to look back and say whether or not the, those versions have been tampered with, can't you? Isn't there some like... Well, okay, so so step back a bit to sort of like um, the history of data storage, if you like. Um, we started writing things on clay and we, we moved to paper. Hmm. And when you overwrote something on a piece of paper, like a ledger, a, a paper ledger, you scribble something out and write something else. Someone comes and says, you've scribbled it out, you put white out on it. You know, like it's hard, right? It's hard to take that ledger and change it. Then we started using magnetic disk. And one of the brilliant things about magnetic disk was that we could overwrite it um, perpetually. It was great because it meant that we could reuse it for different purposes. But it also meant that there is nothing permanent on a magnetic disk. There's nothing that can't be faked. Our entire, again, sort of like to get a bit philosophical about it, the entire data storage of our civilization is now stored on stuff that can be overwritten, providing you have the right permissions. By, and the people who have the right permissions are people like me, d database types, DBAs, developers, 
someone in every organization has enough permission to go and corrupt a database or rewrite it. Now, whether they'll get away with it, different question, but, um, but people are tampering with information all the time. And part of the reason, there's two reasons that we're, at least two problems we're facing now. One is AI that's allowing us to create sort of um, complex information that looks real, like images and movies and so forth out of thin air. And that's kind of scary. But the other is that we've got no we've got no way of looking at, at what's on disk and saying, yeah, this 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 isn't the original version. This was created yesterday, not ten years ago. Something on disk that was created ten years ago looks exactly the same at the bits and bytes level as something that was created yesterday, and that's like a, that's a fundamental thing. And where for a database guy like me, where blockchain got me really excited was nothing to do with cryptocurrency or not even smart contracts so much. But the idea was, wow, for the first time, we've got a digital storage mechanism where I can write something down and I can be sure that no one's going to overwrite it later and falsify it. And that's mm -hmm. a sort of like a that's a paradigm shifting capability. And that's why all of the technologies we've brought to bear on civilization, you know, like as a sort of like an older IT professional, I'm kind of embarrassed by how we let society down. You know, we, we, we thought with social media and the internet, we were going to create this sort of utopian world of free information and, you know, a, a, a more enlightened society. And instead, what we've got is a very polarized society where facts themselves are in dispute. Blockchain is one of the few technologies that's coming along counter that trend. And so this is why I'm such an advocate of using it pretty much everywhere to ensure that we can trust, you know, what's on the disk. Um, let's talk about, you know, and, and what we see. Let's talk about the role of blockchain here. I can guess at it being that I've been hanging around blockchain now for as long as I have, but I'm going to let you take the, the lead on this. You've got proven DB, you've essentially made DB, I'm assuming stands for database. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, you mentioned MySQL, there are a lot of databases out there but you are hitching that database to, to blockchain. So what is it about blockchain itself that makes the information more trustworthy and, you know, or the integration of blockchain into your, into your database solution? Sure. Oh, well, well, blockchain itself, the original um, Bitcoin blockchain to sort of, mm -hmm. you know, go back you know, way back 12 years or whatever, um, was a breakthrough in its use of, um, uh, sort of game theory, economics, and algorithms to produce a ledger that could be used to keep track of transactions between people without having to have a third party observing those transactions. Now we all sort of know that, but it's worth reminding ourselves that that's what that's what allowed us to have cryptocurrency. That we don't have to have a bank in the middle, just sort of like saying yes, you know, David mm -hmm. did send guy a hundred dollars because you know we saw it and we've got a record of it. Instead, you're sending money to me, um, I'm receiving it. The, the blockchain's recording it. Uh, and we trust the blockchain because of the complex algorithms, proof of work and proof of stake that prevent anyone from um, uh, sort of falsifying information. And I don't, I don't really want to sort of like dive into proof of work and proof of stake at sort of like a deep <laughs> level. But, you know, if, if, if it was possible to corrupt the blockchain by now, someone would have done it because there's, you know, trillions of dollars to be had if you can... Um, falsify blockchain transactions, and no one's managed to do it, uh, uh, you know, at least on um, the major public blockchains. So, so we've got this ledger, it's just a sort of like a list of, of entries, and it's sort of append only, and we know it's append only, and we know that no technology short of a miracle could allow us to change something in the past. And but those entries themselves are very, very small. We can't embed, for instance, we can't put a photograph on the blockchain. It's just too much information. There's not enough storage capability there for that. So we have to rely on sort of putting this, the photograph in one location and placing a digital signature, like a hash of that photograph on the blockchain. Now, once we've done that, we have a, a timestamp associated with that photograph that we didn't have before. Now, mm -hmm. photographs do have timestamps in them, but they can just be changed. Anyone with a hex editor can go in and, and change the metadata on a photograph and say, look, it was taken in 1822 by a Canon, Canon SLR photo, you know, camera. You know, that's, you can create that, those entries. It's easy. Mm -hmm. But, but you can't, what you can't do is you can't fake, um, the hash onto the blockchain. So in a way with, 
digital signing technology like HTTPS, it sort of gives us the what and the who, you know, we're signed by a digital certificate belonging to um, Reuters. That's telling us who took the photo. The blockchain entry tells us when the photo was taken. So with the two technologies together, we've got a pretty good lock on who took it, when it was taken. And once you've got that, you can sort of, you know, have a much higher degree of, of um, belief in something versus just having a sort of like a uh, sort of embedded information that anyone could falsify. So proven DB in this case, you, you mentioned this idea of the, the photograph itself cannot be stored on the blockchain. It would just take too much uh, storage space up. Uh, proven DB is the off-chain location of the actual data uh, data that's being stored. Uh, is that not not for Starling. That's an interesting. Um, we don't store we don't store the images. Uh, mm -hmm. They're I think on IPFS. Is that right, Adam? Yeah, there's there's actually three different places, at least three different places with this particular project where the actual files are stored. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important maybe to break that out into the three different main phases of an asset's life cycle that we talk about. And these are not necessarily sequential. They can loop back on each other. But at Starling, we talk about a framework, uh, which is capture, store, and verify. And we need to make sure that across all of those stages that we've thought about the authenticity trail of all of this. So very much to, to Guy's point here, it's expensive to put large amounts of data on blockchains. And so it's not realistic to store a photo and certainly not most videos. Uh, the reality is what we're doing is storing that hash. We're storing registration information. And people can think about it a bit like a public notary where someone is able to get a certain amount of information registered in a more official way with third party witnesses and attestations. But what's so powerful about distributed ledgers is that it's not just one person keeping a copy of that. It's thousands and thousands potentially of different right. servers, each with a copy and with the consensus mechanisms in place, it makes it immutable and it makes it impossible for people to alter it. So David, when you brought up earlier the idea that, well, if you, you were, let's say, Wikipedia and you were having version histories and those could be hashed, that's absolutely true and that would be a great thing. But my question would be, who do you trust to store the hashes? And if you think about any system, you know, I, you can be as, as cynical or as, as optimistic as you might want to be on something. But I think the best way to think about the threat is to think about the politician you trust the least. I don't care who that is, but when I say the politician you trust the least, everyone has someone who comes to mind, I, you know, whoever that may be. Right. Well, imagine that they have control over the, the one ledger of truth, the only one that actually stores the, these hashes. Well, that's a pretty scary thought. And so instead, we say, let's distribute it to everyone. And if you have adversarial entities who all agree and who all have a consensus on something being the actual real hash, then you're able to verify that real information regardless of where it's stored. So, you know, 60 years from now, I could give you a photograph on a thumb drive or whatever really cool technology we've come up with in the future. And even if, you know, I'm an untrusted person, you don't know who I am, you could take that, hash it, and compare it to the blockchain registrations that have been done. And that gives you a sense, exactly as Guy was talking about, of the time it was taken and any other authenticity metadata that may have been rolled into it. I want to circle back to how this all gets stitched together because there was an implication of infrastructure here which to the best of my knowledge doesn't exist um it starts with a camera that itself can take a photograph and then sign that photograph you mentioned that there's like one or two of these cameras out there i, I don't or maybe there's more i don't know but i don't I don't know of a camera that does that. Is is that a modification? And so are we talking about a camera that's like a prototype? And then all of the steps that happen downstream from that, here's this camera, it signed something, now you take that and you move it out of the camera onto something else. So there's there's gotta be a protocol for handling this information because it goes through this journey, ends up you know, on IPFS and, and some way recorded on the blockchain. Uh, just describe maybe if you can that piece of it. Really good question. So uh, in terms of which cameras can do this, we were using a prototype uh, Canon camera, which was used primarily just for this proof of concept in terms of our work with Canon. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows the capabilities of the technology to sign on device. However, I think if you take a step back and look at the whole industry, there is rapidly a shift towards this. So before I mentioned CAI, the Content Authenticity Initiative. And if you look at the people or the organizations and, and companies that are members of CAI and who are behind C2PA, you see Canon, 
Sony, Olympus, Leica. So right now, increasingly, we're seeing press releases every few weeks, it feels like to me now, about brand new, very high-end cameras that support C2PA, which is the spec that I mentioned before, and mm -hmm. can support signing on device. So Leica, for example, has a new uh, camera available. It's not cheap. It's about $9,000. Um, you know, I think there are other cameras out there that we'll see in the next 6 to 12 months, which will be much more affordable. And I think there have been some announced already that are less than half that, depending on the manufacturer. So increase Increasingly, not only do we see hardware developers adopting this, uh, we're also seeing the ability to capture this on mobile devices. And there is free open source software that is available today that people can download from uh, most app stores, including for iOS and for Android. Uh, one example would be Proof Mode, uh, which is uh, available from uh, the Guardian project. And on Android and iOS right now, it works a little bit differently. In Android, you can just have it running in the background uh, while you're capturing any uh, images through any of uh, your existing apps. On iOS, you would just want to go through the app and use the camera within the app, but you're able to sign information, at least on a software level, there. And so the future of this field is really promising in terms of the, the infrastructure. Today, we see a number of very viable options, but not widespread adoption yet. Um, if we're having this conversation six months from now, that might be a very different uh, outlook. And so is that predominantly what Starling is working on is like, hey, uh, the infrastructure, the protocols don't really exist. There, some things are in place, a couple cameras and some technology, but we're going to, we're going to push the envelope on this and find a way to make it all work and actually produce a result out of it. Is that, is that kind of like, are you at the leading edge of that, that effort? You hit the nail on the head with that one, yeah. So we, we are not a, a developer, we're not a manufacturer, we don't sell products. What we exist to do is create case studies. And we demonstrate the possibilities of these implementations, like with the Reuters uh, proof of concept. So mm -hmm. the idea there was that we took a piece of this, uh, you know, this hardware prototype that exists, but you know, Canon and others are, um, you know, you, you'll again, I think, see a lot more available very soon. We've also done what do you this do with, with other it, publishers. Right? You, you, you... You're essentially like, well, what they made this, but now what do we do with it? How do we actually use it in a real world situation? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. You know, you think about the business applications for this. Um, you know, my, this is outside of what we look at at Starling, but for an insurance company, you know, a claims adjuster, having verifiable images of something I'm sure is incredibly valuable. For us, we think about uh, at Starling the human rights implications. So whether that's in journalism, whether that is for admissibility of evidence in uh, criminal trials. In particular, we've done uh, work and made submissions to the prosecutors of the International Criminal Court related to war crimes in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so you can look at that. You can look at historical preservation. Uh, how do we know when deep fakes can create you know, 70 versions of the Zapruder film? How do we know which was the most original version? Well, it's time that we, you know, we make a copy of that now, we register it and ensure that people can always verify that version in the future so that they understand when that was available relative to the types of technology and when those technologies became available. Okay, let's do the workflow and then let's take a, um, maybe take a look at a demonstration of what Reuters has done. And what I mean by the workflow is just walk me through and maybe you guys have to hand off to each other. I take a picture of this Leica camera that can digitally sign the photograph. What happens next? And take me through the whole process. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, in this particular uh, proof of concept, we were using a Canon camera. And again, this was a prototype okay. camera, but you know, there's, there's other versions that are available. So that was in the hands of a photographer uh, who was in Ukraine. And obviously mm -hmm. Reuters is covering you know, uh, some very serious and very heavy uh, stuff. So I'll say that while there's nothing overly graphic in any of the images that may be shown in the video version of this, um, you know, it is still uh, war wartime photography. And so it's a very heavy subject as sort of a, a content warning there. So uh, Reuters photographers were in the field and using this camera so that when the moment that the light hit the sensor of the camera, it, the device itself was signing uh, the resulting file. And not just the pixels, which are obviously very important, but also additional metadata. And so with these sorts of devices today, we obviously have the, the data that uh, Guy mentioned. You know, we have date and time stamps, we have GPS information. And depending on the camera uh, and, and the manufacturer and the, the kinds of data being collected, it can also be important for things that might sound like they're just nerdy photography stuff, but actually have a very important implication to what that image looks like. Really strong example coming out of the Middle East right now uh, in Gaza uh, and, and uh, Israel. If you look at these uh, photos of Iron Dome and you see all these missiles and it looks like uh, there's rockets that there's a hundred in the air at the same time. 
well, that's a long exposure photo. You know, it may have been taken over 30 or 90 seconds. You know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly of the length, but that can give a very stunning sense uh, from a news perspective of how many different munitions are being fired, but it doesn't give you the sense of time. So that metadata could be important. Similarly, uh, the length of a, the focal length of a, a, a lens can dramatically impact the compression of distance in an image and can make it look like people or even landmarks are closer or further apart than they really are. So simply recording that information is really important for people to be able to assess it later. So in terms of this workflow, the very first step is just taking that photo. And so someone is in the field with the equipment that is prepared to actually sign as this information is collected. Now from there, uh, generally a journalist will upload uh, via FTP, uh, pulling things off of their SD card, but they can also tether wirelessly depending on the device and send it into their newsroom. And that's where we start to get into these processes, and maybe, Guy, this would be a good time to, to hand it to you, where as it goes through their newsroom workflow, it's important that we're authenticating changes that are, are made. Just in the same way that a photographer's choice of lens length or shutter speed is important, uh, but very permissible as an edit in many cases, so are the choices editors make in terms of perhaps a future crop or a color correction. So this next step in the process, before Guy takes over, this next step in the process is going to look for the signature from the camera and say, okay, I can, I can work with this. Because if it doesn't see that, if somehow a, another SD card got introduced in the middle there with some other images on it, the process would fail at that point. I just want to make sure that that's part of why we're signing the, the image in the first, that's at least one reason we're signing the image. Uh, I know we talked about some others, but. It's, it's one reason, and I want to be clear that it's a choice. In other words, you know, we could set up systems that obligate that and potentially for privacy reasons or for security reasons, it could be a problem. Uh, just to very briefly give you an example, I know a photographer, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer who has been working in Ukraine in the last couple of years and uh, was very concerned that he might be um, uh, arrested or, or, or kidnapped essentially by uh, uh, Russia. And he realized that if there was certain metadata on his device, that that could lead to uh, people being identified in ways that could be very dangerous and basically involve him in this conflict. So he made editorial choices to remove information. And so real quickly, before we get into the, the, the next practical steps, it is also important to be clear about when people have the choice here and they should be able to uh, be empowered as an opt-in uh, and we should also be having, not now per se in this conversation today, but overall as a society and as an industry, we need to be talking about the choices in privacy and security measures that people take so that it doesn't become about surveillance. So I do want to preface that, but in terms of the next steps in the workflow, presumably, yes, if you're a newsroom, you want your reporters uh, or your photographers to provide this information. And as that comes in, you would be able to verify it. Okay. All right, Guy, take over. What happens next? We, we just, we're in the newsroom. We, we took delivery of an SD yeah. card. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm not deep inside the Reuters uh, system. So they've got their own cloud, um, image cloud, where they've mm -hmm. sort of like store all their images and so forth. Well, it doesn't have to be Reuters. It could be any newsroom. Yeah. 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 But essentially, there's two things that are going on. And Adam's sort of like talked about most of them. As we're going through... Um, the images where we're changing them, um, we're publishing them. Um, we've got to store them and we've got to store the chain. It's like an audit trail of everything that happens to the um, photograph so that you can say, you know, I look in the New York Times, I see a photograph that's a zoom in black and white of a bombed out building. Um, I want to prove or be able to prove that this cropped image is actually taken from the image that was signed by the Canon camera at this GPS location on this particular date. And it's not an entirely, necessarily an entirely perfect chain in all circumstances because, um, you know, there is a sort of like a, you know, someone is, you know, in a war environment disconnected from the internet. So there is mm -hmm. a sort of a gap before it gets into the cloud. But as soon as it goes into the cloud, everything that happens to it is recorded and recorded in such a way that there are blockchain records to support it. So we can sort of go from this cropped image to the image before it, the image before it, the image before that, and then to the original image that was uploaded that contains the digital signature from the camera. And we say, yes, this is this cropped image was taken directly from this original image. And that will okay. allow us to um, have some confidence. If you want to think about how this might work in practice, I like to think, I, I, I wish I didn't, but I still, I still am addicted to Twitter. I still look at it, you know, all the time. <laughs> and... 
you know, if we you all look at Twitter now, you know that it's just awful. And yeah. some of the things that you're seeing, photographs that are clearly fake, but others that are like, could this be true? Could, could, you know, could this horrible thing I'm looking at actually be true? Imagine in sort of like 10 years from now, if there was a little um, Reuters dot, um, and it doesn't have to be Reuters, but, you know, a sort of a, a little button that you could click that would give you some confidence and you would, the, the trust, the, the situation we're in now could be reversed to where, you know, unless it's got that little authenticity, you kind of just tend to ignore it because you know there's so many fakes. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that what that's that dot's the equivalent of the lock you were talk we were talking about earlier, right? It's essentially yeah. Uh, and maybe yeah. Adam, if you've got the the website ready, you could sort of show the the equivalent um, in the um, Reuters PSC. Have you got that up there? I, I just want to point out we're, we're talking about one side of it. Like we're, we're saying, look, this is so you can prove that the photo actually can be. Uh, you, you can take a cropped version of a photo and source it to some sort of originally. Um, a, a authentic version of a larger uncropped version of that photo. And that's mm -hmm. great to be able to make that proof. I mean, I can see why Reuters wants to be able to, without beyond a shadow of a doubt, prove that all the images that it's putting up in its content are traceable to something that's, you know, tr trustworthy and, and, and the veracity of it is, 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 uh, cannot be disputed. Um, but it's equally important <laughs> When somebody publishes a fake, you want to be able to look at it and say to the person who published that fake, well, show me where you got this from. And if you didn't get it from one of these sources, then, mm -hmm. it, you know, so it, it, there's another part of this. It's not just about saying, hey, here's a photograph and it's authentic. It's about proving that certain uh, photographs are inauthentic. So, You're OK, what are we looking right. at here? The problem. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go he ahead, does. Adam. You were saying. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm saying you're, you're absolutely right. And as I mentioned before, there's a reason that Starling uh, tends to focus our work on the upstream because we think that there's a lot of opportunity there to really address it. Right now, mm -hmm. when you know someone has a, a deep fake or other sort of uh, falsified image that they might receive, you know, it, it, the answer that might be returned through whatever systems we produce is, I don't know. And so it's you know an unfortunate reality. So what we have to do is change the expectations of audiences that they are expecting to see whatever we might want to call these sorts of icons or labels. It's a nutrition label. It's the, the lock icon. Um, you know, there's any number of analogies, whatever relates most to people and the understanding that I should be able to inspect. I should have a right to know where this photo came from. If people are purporting to tell me that this is the truth. And so how do I turn that expectation back on the photograph? If it doesn't have this, that doesn't mean that it's inauthentic. It just means that you're, you know, you should be a little more concerned. You should be a little bit more leery of it, and you should probably look a lot more closely at trying to understand why someone may have shared this with you. I can, I hand, can see my browser. I can see my browser in the future saying, "Hey," in the same way today that it warns me about an, uh, that I'm warned that this email could be from uh, somebody with malicious intent. I can see the same thing happening with a photograph, like the browser actually literally flagging it and saying, we don't know where this came from. So, you know, treat it with a grain of salt. Bingo. And that's exactly it. And it's not to dismiss something without it, but to say, treat it with a grain of salt. I, I, I like that. What we're seeing here uh, on screen for uh, those of us watching on, on video is the, uh, the site writersagency.com slash authenticity dash POC. And I'm sure this will be in the show notes. Um, this is an image taken in Ukraine, and even as I'm scrolling, you might notice that there's this little icon in the corner. Um, uh, as you go through the story, you can read more about the background of this actual work. But what's important is that throughout this, you not only have your traditional sort of caption with the date and time and the photographer, but you can also click on this icon right here. And forgive me, I may have to jump between tabs because this will open some additional things as we inspect the image. Um, but as I look here, uh, again, we're being provided with basic metadata. Now, hypothetically, this metadata could be written up out of thin air. Anyone could add it. They could say that instead of 6,000 by 4,000 pixels, this is uh, seven by a million pixels, right? You know, I mean, hypothetically, mm -hmm. the rendering, the display here could be altered. So it's important that you're able to inspect information about this. 
I'm going to return in a second to these buttons in the center, the inspect and the view manifest ones, but those are, are very important. What I wanna do first though, is get into what I'd mentioned before, which is also a part of what is essentially a, a certificate of authenticity, or increasingly in the industry, we uh, hear it being referred to as content credentials. So at Starling, we focus on these stages of capture, store, and verify. So from uh, the moment this is captured, as we're recording this information, and uh, then using, using ProvenDB to, to try and uh, create this log of all the changes, we're gonna start by using different blockchains just to register what's there. So you see open timestamps, which is from Bitcoin, uh, numbers protocol on numbers. Each one of these we can open and view. Uh, I, I think that people would probably be best served to do that on their own time if they wanna dig into this. Um, but you can see we've used a number of different protocols here, uh, including uh, Avalanche and Litecoin. Uh, the question came up before about where this was stored. And so there are three uh, different places on the distributed web where you can find copies of this uh, asset. That includes IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, uh, Filecoin and storage, S-T-O-R-J there. Uh, and so Filecoin uh, is uh, one that's interoperable with IPFS uh, and one that we use a lot, uh, typically uh, sealing data for 18 months at a time. So it creates um, you know, a longer lifespan for this and being a decentralized uh, storage uh, system uh, or network, I should say, uh, this is also using blockchains to do additional registrations, which adds to the ability to verify this later on. And then speaking of the verification, here we have all the changes uh, with proven DB anchored on Hedera. Uh, we have information about Photoshop modifications and then also anything that was changed in the metadata. Pretty much everything you're seeing here, if not on chain itself, has some record of transaction on chain. When I come back to the really practical part, and this is what I think is pretty cool, is when you can get into the inspect part of this. And when I say cool, I mean that for the average user, because a lot of this information is gonna be, you know, potentially, you know, confusing or over the heads of certain audiences. It's understandable. Sometimes I get lost in this myself. So what if you just wanna see what the two different versions of a photo were when it first, you know, the light hit that sensor of the camera, or maybe later after it had been edited. And so that's where that inspect button comes in. I'll just mention real quickly that there's also uh, the manifest. So first I'll show you the manifest here, which just has all of uh, this additional information and helps you to track down where uh, you can find the, this authenticity, uh, the authenticity records. But if I click inspect, that's going to open up uh, the site contentcredentials.org. Before I had mentioned uh, CAI, the Content Authenticity Initiatives, uh, Initiative, and they're the ones uh, who are behind this and help to organize uh, this really great tool, which takes an image like the one that you saw on the Reuters site, and it takes that C2PA spec metadata, and it allows you to then inspect more closely. So you see there are multiple versions here, and really the only major change, if you're looking on, on the right here, is the, is the change in the color correction. You have additional information about the content credentials for each version. Now, what's cool for a, a user is that they can compare. And so I can select the two views, and it might be kind of hard to see uh, if people are streaming this and, and it's uh, low bandwidth, but you can see how there is a lightened version of this image which was used in final publication. To me, as a consumer of news and media, that's a perfectly permissible uh, edit. I can also do a side-by-side -side view like this, which might be easier for people uh, who are streaming this right now. And again, able to tell what was done. What is great is that if something else were done with, uh, let's say, adding uh, you know, Firefly uh, changes with AI to do auto-generative fill of an area, content credentials are being automatically added to a lot of this AI imagery, the generative AI imagery that's being produced. And it would display, assuming that information has been provided uh, within this as well. If it's not uh, made available, let's say it's stripped out, the use of independent databases, uh, blockchains, distributed ledgers, allows us in the future to verify that and to cross-reference. So that even if someone strips out that metadata, you can go and, and find this you know, using perceptive hashing or things like that. And you can then further inspect the credentials of a piece of content, even if the authenticity metadata were stripped out. Uh, this is very, this is an amazing. And I can imagine going back to something that you mentioned earlier, about the documentation of war crimes, how incredibly invaluable this would be, particularly to an international court, because that's precisely the the sort of venue where the veracity of the information that's being presented, the evidence is is 
fundamental. I mean, it's you cannot prosecute somebody unless the evidence itself is guaranteed to be authentic. And this takes things to an entirely different level when it comes to guaranteeing that authenticity. Exactly right. And that's actually some of the other work that we are doing at Starling Labs. So I mentioned before that we have made submissions to prosecutors at the International Criminal Court. Um, and the idea of some of the material that we'd collected for that first was from social media, where people had posted to Telegram. And obviously, we don't control what people are posting, but we can do authenticated web recordings that verify the servers that information came from, the date and time of that information, and then can try and uh, test challenge and challenge certain assumptions about admissibility of social media evidence. And then we worked with uh, photographers in the field who went to those exact same uh, locations and then captured additional uh, verifiable information through photography using actually one of the uh, tools that I mentioned before, proof mode uh, on an Android phone. And that way there is uh, this, this audit trail that people can follow with the images all the way to uh, the court. Uh, similarly, we did a project with Rolling Stone, um, which was called the DJ and the War, Crime, uh, War Crimes and uh, involved a photograph from 30 years ago in Bayelina, Bosnia, where uh, an alleged war crime or series of war crimes had been committed. And um, a photo that became iconic, uh, really, about that conflict uh, had been subject to disinformation for literally 30 years. And so we worked with the photographer uh, who took that original photo, Ron Haviv, and he participated in the digital rescanning of his original film slides. So it couldn't be more original than the film that came out of his camera. And even though it lacks the metadata of a modern digital camera, what we're able to do is provide his attestations about the images. So that's another aspect of this when you think about identity management and you think about you know shared databases that when people can make attestations to say that this was their original image, um, even if we might lack certain digital proof, we are able to create a much better standard uh, when we add that human layer of, of evidence and proof in um, to try and help start addressing things even from the past where we might lack that authenticity data that you would expect will be coming down the line in future cameras. You mentioned one of my favorite words there, standard. And obviously, we're talking about uh, many different standards here in order to really stitch together um, a larger world and framework where the authenticity of the information is checked at every step of the journey. And so I guess one of my questions to either one of you is, well, when are we going to get there? And what I mean by that is you just mentioned the idea of social media. Presumably, it's going to be in the best interests of any social media network to make sure that when somebody's posting an image on onto the network, that it's authentic. That uh, that it's been signed by the camera and 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 I'm just you know looking further out to when all images are signed in the way that you described earlier and I don't know how many years away we are from that you know software signing on smartphones hardware signing with uh, Leica cameras or high end Canon cameras but w when do you think we're going to be there where across a whole bunch of uh, applications and use cases this standard is widely supported in a way that the whole system just becomes much more trustworthy. When well, will the social I'll, I'll network shot. reject, when will the social <laughs> network <laughs> reject an image? Yeah. yeah. I think the pressure is enormous. I think we can't take um, what's going on at the moment for much longer. Um, and so I think you'll see the, the cell phone manufacturers will bring in sort of a, a, an inbuilt standard for signing mm -hmm. photographs within a couple of years um, because without but th that, th then there has know, to be support of that signature there's there has to be support of that signature across the rest of the workflow yeah so to say, but it's still a world. good it's still a good first um it's still mm -hmm. a good first step uh, it's a necessary first step too because we can without that you know you can take a photograph and stick it on the blockchain but uh, you know you can't say you know who took it <sighs> Um, How far so, away are we from that lock from that locked down, more secure, more authentic future, where it's just big, baked into the fabric of everything we do? Three to four years. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic about. Wow. It. I just feel like we'll we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna kill ourselves if we don't get somewhere okay. in this realm pretty soon. Um, Adam, where do you think? How far away are we? I'm going to agree with that. Um, you know, again, you know, both of us, all, all of us can, you know, can, can be very wrong about prognosticating for the future. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that we are in trouble if we don't get this solved in two to four years because the technologies able to fake information are going to continue accelerating at such a rapid oh, pace. Yeah. So 
you know, I, I look back again, let's come back to the example of HTTPS. I mean, I think the actual, you know, concept was created in the 90s by Netscape or something like that. Right. And it was around forever. But then uh, I think one of the things that really helped drive adoption was HTTPS Everywhere, which was, a, I don't know if folks remember that browser extension. I, I think EFF uh, created and supported that. Wonderful tool at the time because that wasn't as, as, as common yet. And then all of a sudden it was just like something something triggered the, the, the widespread adoption. There was a tipping point of some sort. Similarly, there's going to be some sort of tipping point with the technology. Uh, I would be real happy if it were in six to 12 months. I think realistically, it's at least a couple of years out. But if it's more than four years out, I, I would be very concerned. One of the things I think that could help force that, a uh, forcing mechanism, if you will, are the upcoming elections. And so in 2024, we're all anticipating seeing a slew of deep fakes. You already have political ads being uh, created with deep fake technologies and generative AI. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be something that is uh, pervasive. It's going to be something that is also very evident and in people's faces, not just in the United States. And let me underscore that because we in this country are very focused on this country. But there, I forget the exact number, so don't hold me to the, the exact percentage, but something like 80% of people living in a democratic nation, uh, a nation where, where people vote popularly for their government, uh, are going to have an election within a 12 month period. Uh, and it's just first time in history that we know of. And it's just a coincidence that that's coming up. And so this is going to be a big thing in Taiwan. This is going to be a big thing in Ukraine, in the EU parliamentary election, um, all over uh, the world, wherever you have a, a uh, democracy or anywhere with an election, people are going to care about what those photos show. What do they say about politicians? What do they say about the issues? What do they say about election integrity? And so um, that, I think, is what will really bring people uh, to get on board with these technologies. I think it will bring industry on board even uh, more rapidly. So that's why I'm also optimistic that it will happen quickly, but I think we're going to have, unfortunately, some really ugly incidents in the interim. Guy, what is it that one span is going to do to make that happen in three to four years? What's your role in this? <laughs> well, look, we're, we're very proud and supportive of, of Starling Labs' um, efforts. Our focus is in a slightly different area at the moment. Um, financial records, digital agreements um, face their own set of threats. It's not quite so much AI. Um, quantum computers, for instance, are going to um, invalidate all of the digital signatures that have been used to sign every e-signature in history sometime in the next probably five to ten years. Um, so we're using blockchain to create e-signatures that are resistant to that sort of threat and, and as a side effect are resistant to a couple of other sort of like weaknesses that e-signatures have, you know, expiring certificates, private keys being leaked. Um, so, as I said, we're so proud and couldn't be more happy to be part of, of the, um, the fight to sort of fight disinformation. But as a digital agreements company, it's sort of like a side gig for us. Um, but mm. I wouldn't underestimate how important it's going to be to secure all of our information, because this is just an example, if you think about it, about how fragile our sense of facts are. And if the facts underlying your bank account are suddenly no longer trustworthy, um, or the digital agreements that you've signed, um, or you know, Wikipedia. You guys a good example of Wikipedia. You know, if Wikipedia isn't immutable, shouldn't we be trying to make it immutable so that we can't have some hack by Russia in five years that rewrites the entire history of the world? Apparently, um, in line with what I don't want to blame Russia for everything, but you know, a, a, a non-state actor. These are all significant threats as well, and. I sort of repeat what I said before, you know, <laughs> the information, you know, the, the computer industry, the software professionals, we've, we've been involved in changing people's lives over the past generation in ways that are kind of unimaginable looking back. Like when I look back 25, 30 years, um, the changes that we have brought through the internet, smartphones, other software devices, software's eaten the world. Um, but um, we've created a, a whole lot of threat um, and it's up to the software industry to take it seriously and come up with solutions. So, um, you know, we're happy to be doing whatever we can to, to sort of fight the good fight there, I guess. All right. Well, we're, we're glad that one spans there to kind of fight that good fight for us. And hopefully we'll see a, a future where that all of that information is a little more secure. I, 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 
I, I'm, I'm fearful of five years from now that everything that we've digitally signed is no longer worth the uh, digits that it's been written in. But yes. I guess we'll, 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 we'll wait to see that and wait, see, see whether or not that happens and, uh, and the role that you guys, of course, play in uh, maybe resecuring that information before it's too late. Um, and, and Adam, uh, the Starling project, I mean, you guys are literally at the bleeding edge. I mean, I think of you as a systems integrator here. That's what innovators do. They take a bunch of parts and they find a way to integrate them when they don't, when they don't naturally fit together on their own. seems like that's what you're doing. And you're actually bringing a real solution, real solutions to bear right now that are very meaningful. What's coming next for the Starling project? Starling Labs, well, it's that is. exactly. Exactly, and then th thank you very much. But uh, it's it's that integration of all these technologies and all these you know players in this space. So it takes people like Guy and, and Proven DB and you know Hedera, mm -hmm. Filecoin, Canon, Reuters, practitioners, um, you know, especially to actually do this. So for us, uh, it's about finding practitioners to work with on these applied projects and showing you know the art of the possible, and then hoping for uh, you know those proofs of concept, those case studies to continue to drive industry adoption. For us, uh, we're looking to continue to team up with journalists, with people who work in the legal accountability space, especially in war crimes, and also people who are doing work around archiving and historical preservation. We are very excited looking ahead to certain aspects of 3D technologies, anything driven by a 3D engine. So maybe that's a VR headset you put on your head. Maybe it's something rendered from images uh, that were 2D to create a different perspective altogether. But how do you know the underlying scan was accurate? So we're doing some really interesting things with that, recreating historical scenes and capturing current scenes. Perfect example to think about when we talk about quartz is what if a crime scene uh, is changing because of you know, weather or because of other uh, circumstances? You might want to capture that in a 3D you know, scan and make that admissible in court. Well, how how are we going to meet those standards that courts have? And there there isn't a lot of VR in the courtroom. And I'm not saying that it's going to become part of the everyday part of the courtroom process. But those are some of the interesting and, and novel ways that we could start to um, you know look at ways to apply authenticity data to projects which have very real world implications for people. Adam, for those people who want to find out more, where can they find you and where can they find Starling Lab? Sure. So starlinglab.org uh, is our website. Uh, if you look for us, we're also on Substack, uh, YouTube, and uh, LinkedIn. And uh, for me, I'm uh, A-D-J-O-R-O -O on pretty much every social media platform. Even the Twitter that we wish we could get rid of, right? <laughs> I yeah I, I I try not to look too much. It's tough. I, I you know sports is still the one thing. I'm I'm a big sports fan, mm -hmm. and and you you can't really uh you, yeah. you still really hasn't been recreated on Threads or Blue Sky. Can't get no. away from it. We're addicted. I am addicted. I'm sorry. You know, no matter what happens, we're still there. And guy, where can they find you and uh, OneSpan and um, the Proven DB guy solutions? Guy Harrison at, at OneSpan.com. Um, drop me a line if you've got any questions about it. OneSpan.com is obviously our our website. Um, mm -hmm. happy, to, okay. happy to engage further with anyone who's interested. Well, thank you very much. That concludes our webinar. I'm David Berlin, the editor-in-chief of Blockchain Journal, and I've been speaking with uh, Guy Harrison. Guy is the chief technology officer and founder of Proven DB, which was eventually uh, acquired by OneSpan. So that's where you can find him now and hear more about all of the things that uh, OneSpan is up to. And Adam Rose, he's the COO of Starling Lab. They're doing some amazing work. You heard where you can find him. I want to thank both of our guests for joining me today. And we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks, guys. Thank you both.